any closer in the World Rally Championship. With just four rounds remaining, there's a tie for the lead between four-time champion Tommy Mackinnon and Colin McRae. It's by no means a two-horse race, though, because after his win in New Zealand, Richard Burns is right back in contention. Six months since the last tarmac rally, but now we're back on the black stuff in the Italian Riviera. The San Remo rally is a helter-skelter ride of fast roads, tight hairpins, precipitous drops, and fantastical fans. <laughs> The speed of Formula One, the passion of a football match rallying brings Italy to fever pitch for three fast and furious days. around the seaside towns of San Remo and Imperia. It consists of 20 stages covering almost 390 kilometers. And the driver with the fastest time at the end of the weekend is the winner. The weather is notoriously unpredictable in this part of the world in October. It can be sunny on the coast, whilst up in the mountains, the stages are engulfed in cloud. Another hazard to watch out for is fallen leaves, which can make the roads very slippery. Tactics dominated on the gravel of New Zealand, but on tarmac, there's only one policy that works, and that's maximum attack from start to finish. Last year, Poto Gilles Panizzi left the others in the shade on his way to victory. However, accusations of illegal practicing left a bad taste and reduced his then teammate Francois Delacour to tears. It could be a similar story this time with tarmac specialists like Panizzi setting the pace and leaving the leading drivers in the championship scrapping over the minor places. Victory in New Zealand thrust Richard Burns back into the championship ahead of Carlos Sainz and Harry Robin Perra, but behind Mackinnon and McRae. This is a rally that Mackinnon likes. He's had two wins here in the last four years, but this year for San Remo, Mitsubishi launched their new Lancer Evolution World Rally car. The new car could decide whether Mackinnon can keep fighting for the championship, but its success or failure will also determine whether he stays or leaves Mitsubishi. It would be nice to continue with them, of course, but it, of course it would be nice to, nice to see something else also. I think if I will continue another two, two years, I think it's uh, last chance now to, to move somewhere if I want to do it. Like Mackinnon, McRae has won here twice in 96 and 97, but he's not too confident of adding to that tally. The testing hasn't gone tremendously well uh, with, with tyres and also with the car. We haven't made a lot of progress with the car. Uh, I would be pleasantly surprised if we were in the top three after a few stages. Subaru enter all four of their drivers, Petter Solberg, Marco Martin and Toshi Arai line up alongside Richard Burns, whose title challenge is reaching a crucial stage. Well, I think obviously a lot's going to depend on these next two tarmac rallies. We're, we're very confident that we can do well in Australia and obviously in Great Britain as well. But uh, these two rallies, they've been OK to me in the past, but uh, I've not finished higher than fourth on either of them. In Catalonia, the only other all tarmac event so far this year, it was the French teams that dominated with the Citroens of Philippe Bulgowski and Jesus Puras setting the pace before technical problems left the way open for Peugeot to secure a 1 2 finish. Once again, Peugeot nominate tarmac experts Didier Oriol and Gilles Panizzi to score in the manufacturer's competition with world champion Marcus Grunholm in the third car. If Citroën have solved the reliability problems that let them down in Spain, then Bulgowski and Puras could be the men to beat. As well as Puras and Bulgowski, Citroën are entering rising star, current leader of the Super 1600 category, Sebastian Loeb. Skoda returned to the fray after missing New Zealand, and they too are entering three cars for Czech driver Roman Cresta, Armin Schwartz, and Bruno Thierry. In New Zealand, Hyundai led a world rally for the very first time, thanks to Kenneth Ericsson. But here, they have called on local knowledge in the form of Piero Liatti, who teams up with Alistair McCray.
day one and eight stages. There were due to be only six, but Roadworks have forced the organizers to split stages two and six into two. Still 150 kilometers of some of the most heart-stopping stages in the world. Tranquility, but not for long. The residents of Calderadi were given a loud and early alarm call by stage one of the San Remo rally. As championship leader Colin McRae was first off the mark, unlike gravel where the first car is at a disadvantage cleaning the road, on tarmac there's no such disadvantage. But before the rally McRae had feared the competitiveness of his focus with a long wheelbase and a heavy front end, it doesn't turn in as well as the shorter cars. But McRae's talent on tarmac dragged the car through to seventh fastest time. This the moment of truth for Tommy Mackinnon, the first stage for his new Mitsubishi World Rally car. No excuses now. But from the outside, all looked well. But inside, it soon became clear that a transmission problem was making the car very hard to drive. 11th fastest time, a very public disaster for the new car. Next up, Richard Burns. Like McRae on Pirelli's, not a tyre that filled its users with a lot of confidence. So Burns took very few risks. On board, he's driving clearly well within his and the car's limits. But then again, sometimes it's better to drive at 100% than 95. Without warning, four kilometers into the rally, the Subaru had flicked off the road and into the trees. Burns looked more shaken by the lack of explanation yeah. than by the crash itself. News quickly reached the Subaru service area. But luckily, even though the car was in tatters, Burns and Robert Reed were intact. I wasn't pushing hard, just taking things relatively easy, and the, the note was correct as well. Just turned into the corner, slid a little bit coming into the corner, but nothing unusual. But then it didn't regain any grip in the, in the middle part of the corner, and we just slid off on the outside. With Burns' car clear off the road, the rally continued. Carlos Sainz next through Calderoddy. He reckoned his Ford was better than in Catalonia, but maybe not fast enough to fight for first. Armin Schwartz in the Skoda, but an alternator problem was forcing the engine to cough and splutter. And finally expire on the road section after stage one. An unhappy return to the championship for Skoda. But if the regulars were in trouble, the tarmac experts quickly reveled in their love of the mountain roads. 2000 winner Gilles Penizzi was fastest, despite not being happy with the handling of his Peugeot. Two, at least at the start of the stage, was Philippe Bulgowski in the lead Citroen. But right at the end of the stage, the road bit back. Bulgowski had clipped the wall at the entrance to a tunnel, flipping him back to crunch the front two and stalling him for almost half a minute. Hyundai's only real hope here rode with Piero Liatti. But it's been a while since he raced in the World Rally Championship and it showed. Watch the barrier on the right. Liatti kisses it, but it whacks him in the face, slapping him back at the cliff on the opposite side. On the way to stage two, the drivers had to use the motorways, even having to pay the tolls like everyone else. Stage two had been planned as a mammoth 45 kilometer section, but these roadworks meant that the stage was split into stage two and 2B. 
Colin McRae knew after stage one that he was not on the pace of the French cars or even his teammate Sainz. The problem was his transmission. It meant his wheels started locking up. As he climbs the hill, watch here as he almost slides into the barrier, losing time. Tommy Mackinnon also had trouble with his transmission, but his woes were caused by an electrical glitch. But the result was the same, lack of traction. Both championship leaders had lost over half a minute in three stages. Marcus Grunholm never used to like tarmac, but two years at Peugeot has turned him into a formidable talent on the stuff. But he thought he could do better than third. Brake fade affecting his confidence and making him clip the rear of his car on a wall. Didier Oriol also clipped his bodywork, but with no damage. He was still complaining, though, about being made to use a five-speed gearbox. With a six-speed, he reckoned he could have been fighting for the lead. But Oriol was still pushing, hopeful of a repeat of his win on the last tarmac rally in Spain. Inside his helmet, Panizzi was fuming. He'd opted for an electronic active anti-roll bar, and instead of making the car handle better, it was doing the opposite. He'd ordered his team to prepare a new one at the next service. Even with the problems, he was fastest on stage 2B. Bulgowski sported the scars of stage one. Mechanically, his car was fine, but aerodynamically, the Citroen was performing less than perfectly. Amazingly, then, he was second fastest on stage two. At least Jesus Puras's car had all its bodywork. He won stage two, but a severe vibration from a front tire lost him time on stage 2B. <laughs> So Puras has a slim lead from Panizzi. Carlos Sainz, the only top six driver not in a Peugeot or Citroen. And Bulgowski jumps from 27th to 8th. But out of the top 12, both championship leaders, McRae and Mackinnon. There is nobody who has a clear idea what is going on, what is wrong. I hope they can, they can fix it. Otherwise, it's no point to continue because car doesn't work at all like it should be working. Sykes looked to be the only real threat to the Gallic dominance of the rally, but on stage three and four, the Ford driver started slipping backwards. Nothing dramatic, just a steady decline. Worse, he didn't know why. But with the cars dropping like flies, he kept up the pressure. Look at this for precision driving. Francois Delacour decided not to compare his Peugeot of last year and his Ford of this. His results spoke for themselves. He was eighth overall, the slowest Peugeot was fourth. Two wheels up in the air, Didier Oriol was determined to show that Peugeot would be wrong to let him go for 2002. His dislike of their gearbox, though, was still his bête noir. Gilles Panizzi's car had been fitted with a non-active anti-roll bar, and he loved it. It made a huge difference. He took the lead. Citroën won both stages. Stage 3 went to Jesus Puras, levelling the score of stage wins with Panizzi. But on stage 4, he said his notes were too cautious. The service at Imperia, a chance for the fans to see their heroes up close and personal. Their biggest hero, the leader, Gilles Panizzi. Gilles Panizzi was king of the asphalt last year, now he has other plans. I continue to, to take a maximum of points for, for Peugeot, of course, on, on tarmac, and uh, to, to continue to progress on gravel. Now I drive better on gravel and it's, I, I have a very good sensation in the car and it's very more spectacular. 
His antics last year were as spectacular, particularly on the safari, where he was fined for punching another driver. And in Italy, Francois Delacour accused him of illegal practicing. I live uh, maybe one hour the stages. It's very easy to, to say that, but me, I say a lot of things about the, the drivers. I'm not uh, aggressive. I am not aggressive, never, never, never. In general, it's all the time okay with me. All the time with people. And the same with Francois last year. It's okay, no problem. In the end, he has only one aim. To, to stay at the limit, 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 limit all the time. And uh, it's the principal sensation for me. For the last three stages of the day, the weather got considerably worse. Low cloud blanketed the start line. Colin McRae's hopes of a reprieve from a day of misery failed when he stalled his focus twice. Must be hard to get motivated when driving for a place down to the team. Bad visibility and a gearbox problem dropped Marcus Grunholm from third to fifth. Like his teammate Tommy Mackinnon, Freddie Lloyd too had teething trouble with the transmission of his new Mitsubishi. As hard as he tried, the Citroëns were just a bit too fast for Gilles Panizzi on the final three stages. The fastest of the Peugeot drivers ended the day wondering what he needed to do to leapfrog back ahead of Puras and fed off Golgowski on day two. With Pierre Oliatti out, Alistair McRae was the sole Hyundai driver in the rally. That honour almost went off the edge of a cliff when he beached his accent on a low wall and lost ten minutes. First, then second, and back to first again. Jesus Puras retook the lead on the last three stages with another stage win, but the margins were minuscule. The pressure's on the Spaniard. He's never won a world rally. Out on the stage, Citroen's team principal, Guy Freckland, delighted to have three cars in the top five because fifth was the team's superstar of the future, Sebastian Loeb. Two fourth fastest stage times in the last two stages, confirmation of his talent on his debut in the car. A battle royal then for first on Italy's fast road rally. Puras just ahead of Panizzi and a top six full of French cars. Waiting to pounce the familiar names of rallying Delacour, Sykes and Solberg. Day two and eight stages on the schedule. And just in case they didn't make the driver's hearts beat fast enough the first time, the first three stages are run again at the end of the day. 150 kilometers, thousands of turns and thousands of gear changes. Rolling up to the start of the morning's first stage, rally leader, Jesus Puras. It's going to be a very hard day today, uh, but I uh, will try to increase the difference. I mean, it's the only way to think. I have to go flat out. Uh, I think everybody is going to do the same, so I just cannot wait to see what happens. As on day one, stage seven was split into two. First, Paso Taglia at 14 kilometers, and then Molini, almost twice as long. As Pura started the day, the sun came out shining on the Spaniard, who was fastest on stage seven. Panizzi's assault on the lead didn't go to plan, though, losing a second to the Spaniard. On the next stage, it was clear why Puras was trying to open his lead from Panizzi. He was leaving every breaking yeah, point yeah. to the last millisecond. With disastrous consequences, the impact is immense. Puras tries to keep going, but the car is disabled. And with less than two minutes until Panizzi is due onto the stage, Puras and Marc Marti jump out to warn the Frenchman. This is the view from Panizzi's car, passing Puras for the lead. Puras was unlucky to crash, but lucky not to go off a little bit further to the left. Then it would have been a 200-meter drop down a cliff. Yeah, just on the... 
on a very sharp right. Uh, I think when I put the gas, the rear oversteer too much, and then I hit a little wall which is there, and uh, and I, I think I've broken the, the rear wheel, left one. Citroen's honours were now in Bulgalski's hands. His teeth gritted. He fought to catch Panizzi. But in his haste, he was too ragged, clipping the wall on one corner. The impact had damaged his steering, making control of the Citroen very hard. All down the stage, he wrestled with the car. Spinning it again and losing half a minute, dropping him to fourth. might have been out of Bulgalski damaged, but from the disaster came Sebastian Loeb, setting his maiden stage win on a world rally, and only his tenth stage in the Zara. <laughs> world champion Marcus Grunholm spotted a chance to retake the three places he lost on day one. He was third quickest through stage seven. <laughs> But on 7B, he hit a patch of gravel and slid into the barrier, but the damage seemed to be slight. François Delacour finally gave Ford something to smile about, setting third fastest time on Bellini. Estonia's Marco Martin began the day happy with the handling of his Subaru. But again, these tight and unforgiving corners took another prisoner. Reverse quick. Yeah, you have to reverse as we block the stage. Six left long. The damage clear as he crawled out of the stage. Martin was going so slowly that he was quickly caught by Simon Jean Joseph right in a Peugeot. 100. Flat left, tightens to. See how fast 50. the man from Martinique pulls away. 50, 6 right crest, 70, 6 left slow. The championship leaders half wished their rallies would be over, but McRae knew he must push for manufacturer's points. Tommy Mackinnon was in the same situation as McRae. The pair was scrapping for 11th. But whatever his speed, driving with the four-time world champion is a spectacular experience. Watch what he has to contend with. It looked like a demolition derby on the road section before the next stage. Bugalski's body in tatters, but his wheels in place. Grunholm, though, had to bend his suspension back into shape. Worse off, though, was Marco Martin, co-driver Michael Park, relaying the bad news to face. And the rear lateral link is completely bent, so we don't... Out of the picture, Panizzi can back off a little. Loeb was up to second, but almost half a minute behind. In theory, a safe distance. The damage to Bulgowski's car slowed him right down for stage eight. Gnashing his teeth, he fought to get the car to service, but the suspension was out of shape and it threw the Zara into the wall once again. For a while, he was able to continue before the car finally ground to a halt.
donc bah, nous avons un problème de, de pompe électrique, de pompe à essence, pardon. We had an electrical and fuel pump problem, and the engine stopped here. We couldn't get it started again. So we wait here. Donc, we wait here. Voilà, on attend. Just as in Catalonia, the beneficiary of Citroën's woes was Didier Oriol. By setting fast his time on stage eight, he leapt ahead of Loeb to second overall. The only Frenchman to win the World Championship decided it was time to show his younger compatriots how it was done, not even slowing to pass Bogalski. But Sebastian Loeb was in no mood to defer to age or experience. In his meteoric reach for stardom, he kept within a second of the 1994 champion. Marcus Grunholm's Peugeot was far from perfect and neither was his body. Both had taken a big hit on stage seven, so it was quite an achievement to set sixth fastest time on stage eight with one wheel pointing in the wrong direction. Carlos Sainz was another to benefit from the horrors of stages seven and eight. Even with a puncture, the title fighter was up to fourth and crucially on course for championship points. Freddy Leux's rally was still blighted by transmission problems. He was 13th. So after stage eight, Panizzi and Oriol, the two Peugeots, first and second, but Loeb not far behind Oriol. Sykes and Grunholm, fourth and fifth. And for the first time on this rally, Colin McRae and Tommy Mackinnon make it onto our leaderboard. At the service area, Loeb almost colliding with Loix. And scooting back to his car, the leader, Gilles Panizzi, confident of being able to hang on to first. For me, the, the battle is it's finished, the big battle. But uh, now I, I look the Sebastian Loeb times because he drives very fast and uh, we are for the moment uh, 36 seconds before him and uh, I hope I try to, to drive in, in the same, same times. First, uh, best time that I make in World Championship, so I'm very happy. It's, it was a very long stage and um, all people were fighting, so if, I'm very happy to be to go on this stage. Grunholm's crash had done more than damage the back of his car. He wrenched his spine in the off. Marco, like so many of the cars, you've come in with a lot of damage. What happened? It was just just a, I think, mistake in the base notes. The braking was in the wrong place. So I basically braked maybe too late, and there were some pumps, and uh, just couldn't couldn't slow down and hit the uh, concrete wall. Tarmac rally like San Remo, being able to stop the car is just as important as making it go quickly. This is an example of a front gravel brake assembly, and we use a four piston caliper. If you compare that to the tarmac specification disc and caliper assembly, it's a six piston caliper with water cooling to keep the temperature of the brake fluid under control. We use a hydraulically operated handbrake, which is much, much more powerful than a conventional handbrake, coupled to the rear wheels only. The driver will use this for very tight hairpins on both tarmac and gravel. And when he operates it, there's an electronic switch which creates a message to the central computer to operate the centre differential and allow just those rear wheels to be locked. There was no stopping Panizzi after three stages backing off, he went for it on stage 10, setting fastest time by over a second. All this with a malfunctioning automatic gear shift. Oriel might have been pushed by Loeb, but he'd seen the carnage of the early morning, so he took careful lines through stage 9, setting only sixth fastest time. The more aggressive Loeb moved ahead of Oriol after stage nine. On both stages, Marcus Grunholm was second quickest. 
In his hurry, Carlos Sainz cut a tyre on the curve and suffered a puncture. On stage nine, Solberg set his first stage win on tarmac and the first stage win of this rally for Pirelli. Bruno Thierry was running on a new suspension setup in his Skoda and he was 14th overall. Alistair McRae complained that the stages were dirty by the time he came through in his Hyundai. Stages 11, 11B and 12 were reruns of earlier stages. That means more rubber and more debris on the road. Penizzi picked up another fastest stage time on stage 12, as if to say, I'm still the master of this rally. But it was the fight for second that was grabbing everyone's attention. Oriol went fastest on stage 11 and grabbed back second place by nine tenths of a second. Loeb's finesse comes from his first love, gymnastics. He won his second stage of the afternoon to grab back second and hold on to it to the end of the day. Fourth and waiting for the French to trip each other up, the world champion Marcus Grunholm. He'd have liked more grip and more speed, but really Carlos Sainz had no problem with being fifth. If he can keep it into day three, it'll mean climbing to third ahead of Burns in the World Rally Championship. All that smoke, it's a miracle that Delacour had any rubber left on his wheels, but all that drama paid off. On the last stage of the day, he finally passed Peter Solberg to seventh. With an Italian fanfare, Renato Travaglia set second fastest time on stage 11, Bellissimo. Peter Solberg had high hopes of another stage win. But they went out of the window when he bent his right rear wheel on a curb. Out of the stage, Solberg headed for service by crabbing down the Italian motorway. But the stress on the tyres meant a roadside pit stop. And finally, the safety of the service area. Not so Alistair McRae, he had to retire in a town centre. We lost the brakes towards the end of the last stage and stopped and tried to re-bleed them, a calibre had gone, but there's something in the pedal box bent, so we've got no brakes at all, so park it up. So at the end of the day, Panizzi looking comfortable in first, but a fight still to be won for second. Also up for grabs, fifth. Sykes just four seconds ahead of Travaglia. Solberg's problems means that he's now at risk from Jean-Joseph. McCray and Mackinnon, 10th and 11th. Just as competitive for man and machine is the Super 1600 Championship. Sebastian Loeb's rise to the Premier League has highlighted the talent that is in Super 1600. Sebastian's doing an amazing job in the Citroen Zara T4. Um, I think you know everybody knew the potential to do that. He's proven it here, and I think that proves that the Super 1600 works. In San Remo, Larry Coles in the Peugeot 206 moved into third after Cedric Robert and Gian Domenico Basso dropped out on the final day. Francois Duval was second in a Ford Puma. But the winner was Andre Della Villa, who led from start to finish in a Fiat Punto. With Loeb's absence, Della Villa has closed to within six points. The next round is in Corsica. 
day three, just four stages, but all difficult ones. And as on days one and two, many of them repeated to keep the action close to the spectators and the service area. Storm clouds gathering over San Remo. Day three began before dawn, and all eyes were on the sky, not the road. 33 seconds is, is good, of course, but uh, for the moment, the meteor changing, and uh, it's uh, difficult to choose the tire because uh, it's raining, but not a uh, lot, and not uh, uh, all the, on all the road, so fog sometimes, etc. Tire talk two at Citroen, but an extra problem for Sebastian Lowe. I don't know the car on the wet, on the wet road, so it would be difficult. I think I have to learn and to understand how it is. And uh, Oriol is not far uh, behind. And he has very much experience, so he, he knows. But uh, you no, know, he has a lot of experience in the French Championship and. Uh, you know, he's born in the north of the France, so it was raining a lot and foggy a lot, so... Because of the wet conditions on 14, for stages 13, the drivers had to compromise on rubber. <laughs> Panizzi's half-minute lead looked big enough, but he was not about to back off. Behind him, Loeb had already shown himself to be a star in the making. the young gun of rallying, Sebastian Loeb rolled up to the start. His aim not to catch Panizzi, but hold off Oriol. But Loeb was fastest on the stage, not only extending his gap to Oriol, but also narrowing the deficit to Panizzi. The third of France's three rallying musketeers, Didier Oriol, but with his wheel locking up on the mulch of leaves and dew, third was the best he could manage. Marcus Grunholm had his fingers crossed that the French infighting would result in a few retirements. But in the end, it was his arms that he had crossed. Grunholm calls out as his power steering fails. His co-driver Timo Rautiainen tells him to be careful. Carlos Sainz opted for hard tyres and they worked well on the dry tarmac. He was hopeful of being the only title challenger to score points here. But first, Sainz had to fight off Renato Travaglia. Pumped up by the Italian fans, he set second fastest time on stage 13. The promise of bad weather was potentially good news for Colin McRae. He relishes foul conditions, but on the dry, he was still off the pace. Super one, super one from weather three. I report you the last condition that we have. With the rain closing in, the teams relied more than ever on their weather crews out in the field. We have uh, stationed roughly on, on each particular competitive section approximately three, uh, three people. And uh, we have a code system that uh, we get them to report back to us on the exact conditions, you know, whether dry, the road is dry, humid, damp, or raining or whatever, or, or and also the temperature, ground temperature, air temperature so that we can uh, actually monitor progress back here on a, on a regular basis. Weather one, weather one from Super One, confirm. Looks like towards the finish of the stage, John, there is B11. In many ways, if you've got accurate <coughs> weather information, you can have a real edge in getting your drivers going quicker. That's the idea of it, yes, to try, <laughs> obviously try and beat the opposition and get the right tyre choice. There's also a safety aspect if we were to do these stages on a dry compound tyre. Although it's got a tread pattern, it doesn't work in the rain. Only now will we find out who was best prepared for the patchy rain. Grit was at a minimum as Panizzi found out first.
This was Loeb's first drive of the Zara in the wet, but with the sparks flying off the titanium under tray, he was fourth fastest. Oriel hates the fog. He thinks it favours only the British drivers. He was 17 seconds down on 15 kilometres, enough to make second look less and less likely. Marcus Grunholm is another one who hates fog, but the thing that slowed him most was the broken power steering. Another minute lost and so too a points position. Carlos Sainz won stage 14, the first for Ford and only the second for Pirelli in Italy. It meant he moved to fourth. Trevalier dropped 11 seconds to Sainz on Colle d'Ogier, moving down to fifth, but the gap between them was only five seconds. This is why these are the best drivers in the world. If you can see where Delacour's going, then rallying's for you. But Delacour did admit later to being scared, not surprising at 120 kilometers an hour with 13 meters of visibility. But Delacour had now inherited Grunholm's sixth place. Italian mist, Scotch mist, what's the difference? Cheering on their man, McRae, to 16th fastest time was Collins' Tartan Army. Further down the mountain, the visibility was better. Marco Martin was third fastest. The Czech, Roman Cresta, also shone in the murky conditions. He was 11th quickest. So Sites on course for three points and Delacour up to sixth, but the French still one, two and three. Grunholm has only two stages to retake sixth and to fend off Solberg. Mackinnon is now hot on McRae's heels. So with the forecast changeable, which tyres to choose? At Michelin and Pirelli, the engineers have been readying all their choices of rubber. Largely depending on how much water there is on the, the surface, of course, but they can stay with the slick tyre that we've had already used this weekend with a softer compound for the special wet grip, or we move to the intermediate type of product, which, of course, when the road is really waterlogged, will allow us to drain the surface much better. How much cutting can the engineers do before they turn it into a tyre that's actually illegal? Well, there's, there's a fair amount of cutting that can be done. It's almost limitless. But you've also got the risk then of making the tyre unstable from the driver's point of view. When you take out rubber from the pattern, it makes the pattern move more. So they want to keep the, the strong feeling when they're driving hard. Going into the last two stages, what have you put your Pirelli cars on? We've put them on an intermediate tyre because we think the water is actually going to be quite, quite strong up there. And we believe we need an intermediate product for the conditions that we're going to encounter. This would be the biggest test of the rally. Heavy rain, slippery roads, and the rally still in the throes of being settled. Panizzi is Peugeot's tarmac expert, but how good would he be in the rain? Leaves, even chestnut shells go in the road. Panizzi was right on the ragged edge. The last stage was Loeb's first ever in the rain in the Zara. Now there was no time for learning. This was a chance to not only pull away from Oriel, but maybe even catch Panizzi. The Citroen certainly looked faster, but only the clock would tell. And tell it did. Loeb was 21 seconds faster than Panizzi over 30 kilometers. The race was now on for victory. Second fastest was Sykes, determined to settle once and for all his fourth place. Just two more stages of Mackinac will be out of his misery. But he didn't have to wait that long. The Finn found a wheel, damaging it enough that his rally was over there and then. This had been a disastrous debut for Mitsubishi's new Lancer World Rally Car. Back on the stage, the rain had made the driving treacherous. Here, Marco Martin aquaplaned into a wall, flipping his Subaru onto its roof for a 50-meter slide down the stage. Four other cars also crashed in the same spot. 
Amazing Lee Martin and Michael Park escaped unheard. Amazing because just look at the state of their car. It is no problem. It, 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 it looked quite bad, this accident, but actually it wasn't, wasn't too bad. It's just, um, it was very high speed, but, uh, but luckily the uh, car was very strong. There was no, no worries at all. The rain kept falling for the start of stage 16, and on the form of stage 15, that meant Panizzi should be worried about low. Second, but with Citroen not scoring manufacturer points, he gets six points for Pojo, whether he was second or third. Sainz knew that Trevalier would need to be a second a kilometre faster to get back to fourth. Not likely, but not impossible. Trevalier, though, had decided that it was more valiant to finish fifth than not at all. He might have known the roads better than the others, but his drive was still impressive. It had to happen sooner or later. Francois Delacour won the last stage of the rally with typical speed and sparks. His final position, sixth. Tiptoeing through the slide, Peter Solvo dropped back another place from eighth to ninth. The place lost to Colin McRae, so nearly making it into the points after what he described as one of his most frustrating rallies ever. His parting shot, a second fastest time on Colidogio. But all eyes were on the clock. Would Panizzi be able to fend off Loeb? Panizzi was wider eyed than ever. The pace notes of his brother Hervé faster than ever. Right to the last corner, he was at full chat. Feeling the pressure the most, his wife Michelle back at service. Panizzi's time, 10.27.1. Back on the stage, the rain was falling again. Was it too late to give Loeb the advantage he needed? Citroen camp, applause, but for first or second. 10.26.7, Loeb had not been quick enough. For the second year in a row, Penizzi had won in San Remo. Your second win here in two years, you must be very happy. Yes, yes, very happy. Uh, this, this victory, it was very difficult, which uh, all the drivers, uh, Citroën and uh, uh, the last uh, driver, the young driver, maybe the faster driver. In San Remo, Sebastian Lowe proved he's a champion of the future. I'm very happy. We made, I think, a very good rally. Uh, at the beginning, we started a little slowly because uh, I had to learn the car. It's the first rally for me in this car. And uh, after that, we, we pushed more and more and more. And uh, in the second day, we made two best times. So I was very happy. Today, we are quite happy because uh, with the rain and the fog, we managed to, to do better times. I think today, at the end, we were the fastest uh, on the lake. And, uh, Yes, we have to hope that in, in Corsica we get some rain. Yeah, it hasn't really changed a lot apart from Carlos getting a few more points, but uh, you know, championship-wise, it is still looking okay. We're sort of the damage limitation is going pretty well. 
So confirmation of the final result. Panizzi winning by 11 seconds from low, but all French top three. Sites picking up points for four. With Sites the only title contender to score, he's the only mover at the top of the table, usurping Richard Burns. Panizzi's win lifts him level with Grunholm. Ford's points here take them well ahead of Mitsubishi and Peugeot. So French drivers, cars and tyres filled the podium and it's not even the French round of the championship. That comes in 10 days time in Corsica, where there's more drama guaranteed on the rally of a thousand corners. Panizzi is likely to be a contender there too, as are Oriol and the Citroëns. But for now, Panizzi and Peugeot have San Remo to celebrate. From the Italian Riviera, goodbye.